this morning we have Dr. Kimberly Blake up first on our agenda. Dr. Blake? Hi. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Let's start. Do you have anything you want to put on the screen? Um, I just have this, these pictures, and then the rest I have, um, I can pass around some okay. papers. Um, uh, I appreciate the opportunity to experience, um, uh, to share some of my experiences. A family member, um, a parent of a child uh, who had cannabis use disorder who has subsequently died from an overdose. Um, I get a little emotional about it, but um, I'll work through. <laughs> uh, close to 30 years ago, my husband and I moved to um, Burlington where I could begin um, residency as an OBGYN at EVMMC. Our son was three months old, and we chose to live in Vermont because it seemed like a great place to raise our family. There were lots of outdoor activities and a focus on health and wellness. We did our best to engage our children in tennis, hiking, and skiing as a family, um, soccer, lacrosse, and football as team sports. We were very relieved when our older son, Sean, showed little interest in drugs and alcohol in the middle school years. What we didn't know was that when we moved to Vermont was this Vermont is ranked high among the highest states for teen use of alcohol, marijuana, and cocaine. When John was a senior in high school, he began using the high-level THC products, oils that were baked. At the time, we had no idea that this was even a possibility. He was, um, it's fairly popular right now, but he was um, way ahead of his time. There was no telltale odor of marijuana. The, um, vaping instrument looks like a pen. You would never even know what was going on. Um, our son was leaving school for an hour a day to use these vaped products, or also known as oils or dabs, and we were unaware by the time he came home from school he did not appear intoxicated. What we did notice was a very rapid, extreme change in his mood. Later on in life, Sean was diagnosed with bipolar depression, and what seemed like a manic episode exploded. He went from being co-captain of the varsity alpine ski team, a senior leader, a slam leader in South Burlington, an AP honors student, to barely graduating high school. Some of the episodes we experienced were um, a car accident where he rolled his car into a ditch. Um, another evening, he was found by the police in a local park confused and covered in mud. He could become combative and aggressive, and I get Terry thinking about this when he would fight with, um, physically with, with us and his brother. He became paranoid and restless and delusional. He felt that the police were out to get him, targeting him through our local newspaper. We, as concerned parents, took him to his doctor, um, who immediately suggested a drug test. What we did upon finding the results of the drug test, to our surprise, was only marijuana. We thought for certain he was doing hard drugs, and in fact, it was um, marijuana was the only thing on his drug screen. We struggled to find a psychiatrist, um, and it was at that time almost impossible to find an adolescent child psychiatrist um, for his mood disorder. However, we were able to find uh, good help um, with substance use disorder at Center Point and then later at the day one program. Interestingly, um, without even treatment for his mood order, with sobriety and absence of marijuana, his mental health improved significantly, significantly such that after a year of sobriety, he to us appeared completely normal. He entered um, the U.S. Navy. He went through basic training. He was selected to um, serve in the um, Submariner program. It's an elite program in the Navy that is restricted only to the top 3% of enlisted personnel. He went through um, Submariner training and did very well through training. However, in the course of a few weeks after completion of training, he um, visited a high school friend of his in New York City and resumed consumption of marijuana. Um, within just a few short weeks of resuming consumption, he came home to visit us at Easter time 
and was again displaying all of the characteristic behaviors that we had seen. And no sooner than a, a few weeks after he returned to base, after the short visit home, he was taken to a local psychiatric hospital after a suicide attempt. He was discharged from the Navy and he was charged with possession of cannabis and that was his only um, charge. Unfortunately, during this time after discharge of being in the Navy and we th believe it started also at, during the time that he was in the Navy, he started to use harder drugs and became addicted to opiates. He went for treatment to um, Hazleton Betty Ford in Minnesota and he then later transferred to California and he was sober. Again, his mood changed dramatically. He um, swore off opiates at that point in time, but soon after um, a relapse, again, it was the same frightening um, set of symptoms. He ended up going to uh, New York City and was lost for several months. Um, we didn't know where he was. He was finally found after shoplifting. Um, multiple episodes of shoplifting, a very kind judge recognized the psychiatric distress he was in and had him sent to Rikers Island where he um, received uh, treatment and evaluation. He was finally able to, um, to come home and at that point he felt that he was done with opiates but he felt that he could continue to use marijuana, um, that it would help with his mood disorder, that would help him even out his moods. <laughs> What we saw was the exact opposite, was that at, whenever he would resume using marijuana, he would have instability of his moods. A few years later, after a period of very significant, very pleasant stability, he had another episode. One night he was found by the Burlington Police Department. He was psychotic and delusional. He thought he was a member of the Grateful Dead family. My office is directly across from the emergency room, and I heard from, that he was there, and between the time I went from my office across the street, he pulled out his IV and left. He had already been discharged. Unfortunately, if you're not um, actively homicidal or just suicidal, even if you're quite psychotic and delusional, you could be released from the emergency room. There's very little that parents can do to intervene in their care. Some weeks later, I called the police when Sean broke into our home, twice within 24 hours. My husband was out of the town, and when Sean was um, in some of these episodes, he could be very aggressive, and I was fearing for the safety of our younger son. If there had been any way to have had a mental health evaluation, I would have done it, but there was not that availability, so I felt compelled to call the police. Eventually, Sean landed in jail, where he failed mental health court. He went to several sober houses, each time being discharged within 24 to 72 hours for using marijuana. Mm -hmm. It was the one thing he just could not give up. Um, I don't have it here, but I uh, can circulate later. There's a video of Sean um, at St. J. Work Camp speaking with members of the legislature asking for better mental health care at the St. J. Work Camp. Unfortunately, after his release, he, was, um, he resumed marijuana consumption and 38 days after release, while high on marijuana, he used a substance that he thought to be cocaine, which turned out to be 100% fentanyl. Of his mental health, I'm convinced that the marijuana use, especially the high dose that he was using, adversely affected his mental health. The difference was truly a Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde type appearance. Thank you. I couldn't believe how genuinely caring, pleasant, and cooperative he could be if he was not under the influence. His letters from his time in jail for the few months before he died, he reflected relatively normal intellect and mood. Um, upon um, incarceration, I, I feel very fortunate for the last year of his life. I have um, several beautiful letters and cards. Um, it, it really took our family by surprise, and it wasn't actually until several years of Sean's use that he admitted that he was, was dabbing this whole time in high school, and it wasn't until he told me about his um, uh, supplier of the oils, it was a lab that blew up in Winooski in 2016, that he admitted that that was what he had been using in high school. We had, had no idea that it was this uh, supercharged marijuana. 
Um, I recently listened to Governor Hickenlooper's reference report on youth, report, youth use after legalization, where he notes that there's a percentage of decrease in smoke, smoking of marijuana, which goes from the minimal amount down by about 3%. But there is an increase in the use of dabs, which is what my son was using, by 7% in Colorado, and a use of edible <coughs> increase by 8%. Data by self-report can be confounding. As an OBGYN, I can tell you that pregnant women in Colorado have dramatically decreased their use because there's a DCF report filed if they admit to use of marijuana during pregnancy. However, the cord blood of the neonates shows the one-third increase in THC component after legalization. I recommend that there be more study before jumping on this bandwagon. We need to ensure that we aren't hurting our kids by starting commercial sales. Marijuana is a Schedule One drug and it has been hard to study and we need more um, data. I have a recent report from the American Journal of Medicine just in this last year, a review and commentary, and there are a couple of points from this review that I'd like to share with you. Marijuana use starts early in Americans and is the most commonly used illicit drug in Americans 12 years of age and older. 7% of 8th graders, 15% of 10th graders, and 21% of 12th graders report use in the, within the last month. Of adolescent users, 2.7% meet criteria for addiction, cannabis use disorder, which is what our son had, as compared to 4.9% of adult users. Lifetime marijuana use reported in 2016, 15% in the ages of 12 to 17 use marijuana. This is compared to 22% age 65 and older. Few Americans believe that regular cannabis use is harmful to health and legalization in 29 states has increased the public's interest in possible benefits. However, regular marijuana use is associated with a range of behavioral abnormalities. Adolescents who use marijuana are twice as likely to smoke more marijuana and become addicted to those who, become smoke, who begin smoking cannabis at a later age. Regular use of cannabis is associated with a decline in short-term memory and cognitive function, poor school and work performance, mood disorders, and psychosis. Marijuana impairs the ability of operation of airplanes, automobiles, motorcycles, and trains, and its effects appear to be dose dependent. For instance, automobile accidents occur two to five, seven times more likely. There's evidence of permanent neurologic change associated with marijuana use that begins prior to the age of 21. And this is from a very respected journal, the American Journal of um, Medicine. The clinical significance is that chronic marijuana use is associated with abnormalities in mood and cognition. Abnormalities in the brain maturation in the areas of the brain that subserve mood and, mood and cognitive function are present on functional brain imaging in chronic users. There appears to be a dose-response relationship to these abnormalities and regularity of marijuana use. In contrast to adults, the abnormalities in cognition associated with chronic marijuana use under the age of 21 do not resolve with abstinence. Um, one of the, uh, I guess, benefits of having a child with a severe psychiatric illness is that you get to meet other parents who have children who are similarly affected. I think that I'm close friends with probably the um, parents of the probably most seven or eight um, affected children in Burlington. I would say that most of them can't be here today because they're busy dealing with their child's severe mental illness, but a good substantial majority would say that they have um, anecdotal experience that the use of marijuana has significantly adversely affected their child's mental health. Um, I would like to introduce my very good friend, Ron, who shares a similar story, and he's going to... Thank you, Kim. And I will share my articles for your review. Thanks. Kim's story is all too familiar, unfortunately. Can you favor and identify yourself for the recorded right. uh, record? Uh, my name is Ron Coppola. I'm a resident of Essex. Welcome to my family's lives. A life now filled with delusional thought and insult. Once a good life filled with soccer championships 
and promising career as an apprentice plumber. All of it derailed by my son's steady, high-potency THC uh, in the confines of a good neighbor's home, surrounded by his high school buddies. It's a life of schizophrenia. It's a life that has changed my marriage, my relationship with my children, my relationship with my grandchildren and neighbors. At times I'm overwhelmed by a nightmare, the notion that we're on the verge of normalizing pot to the extent that pacifiers will be impregnated with THC. The high school buddies are long gone. We have separate dinners, for holidays, we argue over the dangers of antipsychotic drugs. We argue over calling the police. We argue over trying to preserve our own health and sanity. Statistics bear out the fact that we'll die earlier because of the stress. Our children don't understand. Our grandchildren don't understand. Their parents feel a need to protect their preschoolers from their own brother. As a result, we don't see them too often. Instead, we plan for retirement, much different than we imagined. Our wealth diminished by court costs, lawyers, and the search for medical treatments. Precious time, money, spending, feeding, clothing, and housing are permanently disabled loved one, someone who can't manage his own life. I don't want to be here. I don't want to relive this. But you have abdicated your oath to protect Vermont citizens. My participation and your willingness to hear my story tells me everything about the mindfulness charter of this committee. But on the other hand, it tells me nothing about why we're proud to be Vermonters. Marijuana use was illegal and harder to get when marijuana psychosis struck my son. He was 20. But I was unaware that over the decade, technology has weaponized this genetically altered breed of plant. The representatives on this panel and various other committees have been presented with evidence. Ubiquitous THC in all its forms and it all indicates or, or pressures kids for earlier use. You have been presented with controlled medical studies, correlations between THC and schizophrenia. You have seen statistics, harm caused by commercialization in Colorado. You have access, studies explaining how important pruning of the brain synapse is for brain health in young adults and THC inhibits that calling. The legislature has taken action against, actions against unvaccinated people. They protect the immune compromised community. Tell me how many people are dead or permanently disabled because they were exposed to an unvaccinated person. And then compare it to the amount of people who will be disabled by the exposure to weaponized commercial THC. We see them more than ever now in the ER and at NAMI support groups. Regulation doesn't take away the liability of psychosis. Putting an age requirement into law doesn't shield underage consumption. Taxa taxation funds don't cover for the lifetime disability costs. My ask is for the members to gain the insight needed to produce or deny policy that protects our communities. I don't want to wait until your loved ones, spouses, sisters, brothers, nieces, nephews, sons, daughters, grandchildren suffer the throes of marijuana and do psychosis. So far you have chosen, chosen to marginalize the science against commercialization and underestimated the discipline needed by curious underaged individuals to exercise restraint. I urge the committee to wait another year or two while new data and science will be released on this subject. 
I am one of many who have chosen not to come forward until today. If you fail, fail to act, there will be a tsunami of adolescence addiction and unintended consequence. My son can no longer ask coherent questions, so I will. Why are you unleashing an industry that prom promotes a business model to get 20% of its users to consume 80% of its product? Only to find themselves addicted, incarcerated, and disabled. Why are you making it more difficult to keep families together? More won't be able to cope. More will take their own lives. It's a no-brainer. If my son had his mind back, he would argue that pro-commercialization advocates are more insane and delusional than he ever was or will be. He would say, put that in your pipe and smoke it. Thank you. My name is Bob Troyer, and I'm the former United States Attorney in Colorado. I stepped down as U.S. Attorney about six months ago. So I was the U.S. Attorney or the second in command in the office the entire time uh, we've had uh, commercialized marijuana. So for eight years, starting in 2010 until six months ago. Well, they just start talking, or what do you? Um, what, what's the best way to proceed? Uh, if you have some prepared remarks, that would be um, that would be helpful. Okay, great. Well, let me let me give you what what uh, I thought might be helpful was just to give you some lessons from Colorado. This is an issue where it's easier for people on both sides to get very excited and uh, emotional. And sometimes it helps to hear, uh, I have found in other states considering what you guys are considering, to just hear from a place that's had a lot of experience and try to just give you some facts about that Colorado experience, some, some uh, lessons beyond the rhetoric. Um, the, the first lesson is that commercialization really, really, really changes the atmosphere and the life in the state where it happens uh, very quickly. We, we had uh, over 3,000 marijuana licensees in the state very quickly. We have and now have in the state more marijuana stores open retail selling of marijuana in, in actual brick and mortar stores than we have McDonald's and Starbucks combined. Uh, the media attention, the sights, the sounds, the smells, the physical presence, the advertising um, is kind of overwhelming. It, it really has changed the culture and atmosphere of Colorado uh, pretty quickly, and that's pretty embedded here now. Um, and what was not done in, in Colorado when this happened here with any cost-benefit analysis. And so I thought it might be helpful for you guys to understand uh, just from our experience what cost we've experienced, um, what the impact of marijuana had been in Colorado, and then talk a little bit about benefits so you can do what uh, the hard work you're supposed to do, and that is weigh costs and benefits before making an important decision for all your voters. The first cost uh, is broadly, there, there are really three or four categories. Um, broadly, the health of the population, specifically health of your youth, your adolescents, has been the biggest impact in Colorado. Um, 
I have found over these many years that looking at, at usage data is kind of a red herring. Uh, looking at adolescent usage data, high school usage data is a red herring. What's more helpful to look at are the actual statistics from public health officials. I'll give you some of those um, that show the impact on youth rather than relying on surveys given to high school students while they're in a classroom have proven to be uh, inaccurate and don't and don't reflect the real problems. In Colorado, the, the health official statistics show the, the uh, frequency of use has increased, the number of people, I'm talking about adolescents now who've used, has increased, the potency of what they use has increased, and the delivery devices they use, the, the vaping devices that they use, and, and the difficulty in detection, detecting the devices and detecting their usage, that has increased dramatically. In other words, smoking joints uh, very infrequent among adolescents. Vaping through something that looks like uh, a flash drive or looks like this standard highlighter. You can now buy it in hundreds of stores in Colorado, something that looks exactly like a common school supply, like this, that's actually a base pen. Uh, so all of that uh, has changed. In terms of in terms of actual data, the dropout rate uh, in high school students since legalization in Colorado has increased. The marijuana cause poison center admissions for adolescents in Colorado has increased 500% since retail legalization. In the age category 10 to 24 year old, 10 to 24 years old, there have been 200 more suicides in Colorado since retail legalization went live, 200 more a year. Uh, since legalization went, went live in 21% of adolescent suicides in Colorado now. The, the victim, the person who committed suicide, has marijuana in their system. Uh, the health official here, the officials here report increased adolescent depression. Um, they report now, again, this is this is a little looser because it's based on survey statistics, uh, but one in five Colorado high school students now is a regular drug user. Uh, that, that number was three times lower than that before retail legalization. Another uh, interesting statistic uh, there's a city in Southern Colorado called Pueblo, Colorado. It's only a city of about 100,000 people, but it's the city that has most desperately embraced retail marijuana and has the laxest restrictions and aggressively uh, invited uh, marijuana into its community to try to profit from the tax dollars. Um, recently, a uh, hospital study was done there and now 50% of the newborns born in the Pueblo Hospital test positive for marijuana. 50% of the newborns test positive for marijuana. So those are some statistics about, uh, about adolescent use. We've also seen an increase among adolescents, as I said, in the use of higher concentration products the changeover from smoking to vaping. Now almost a third of adolescent users uh, vape, and when they vape, they're using much higher concentrated products, much, much higher percent THC. Average THC 
in our retail uh, flower marijuana, smokable marijuana is 20%. The average in our vape product is 60% THC and goes all the way up to 97% THC. Um, the public health statistics from Colorado that we've seen since legalization that in fact affect the broader population, not just adolescents. 151% increase in traffic fatalities on the roads in Colorado. 151% traffic fatality increase. 52% increase in emergency room visits in Colorado for marijuana. Um, overdoses, 148% increase in marijuana hospitalization. There's a number from, uh, the, actually from the Federal Department of Transportation that indicates that marijuana users are 25% more likely to be involved in a, in a car crash after marijuana use. Uh, the other thing we've seen that uh, uh, is contrary to what we were told by the industry when voters started for this, alcohol use among Coloradans has steadily increased every year since retail marijuana legalization. The opioid death rate in Colorado has gone up every single year since retail legalization. When I was U.S. Attorney, we were part of numerous um, high resource, highly committed opioid enforcement and opioid use reduction initiatives. Despite the work of all of the people, public health officials and law enforcement uh, over the last five years to reduce opioid deaths, opioid deaths in Colorado have gone up every single year since we added commercial marijuana to the addiction mix. Another, another category of impact uh, that, that doesn't get enough attention in, in my view, that's really been uh, very, very dominant in Colorado is the development of two black markets. Two distinct black markets for marijuana have developed since since retail legalization here. Uh, the first is the local black market. There's a price disparity between what you can buy at the retail, the regulated retail establishment that has all the costs associated with taxation and, and, and regulation and brick and mortar production. There's much, much cheaper marijuana to be had on the street, so to speak, than at a retail establishment. And those who can't afford uh, the price differential buy from the local retail market. Every single state that has uh, invited commercialization and commercial retail marijuana into the state has vast overproduction. That overproduction by the growers goes into either a local or a national black market. Colorado has the lowest overproduction, and the industry brags about how low the number is. The number they brag about, uh, the industry brags about here, is that in Colorado they only overproduce six metric tons of marijuana last year. That's six metric tons of marijuana that was grown here legally, but not sold in a retail store. It either went to another state for sale or was sold on the black market. In California, that number is over a million pounds. In Oregon, it's several hundred thousand pounds last year. Um, the national black market involves international drug cartel. When I was U.S. attorney, we prosecuted Cuban cartels, Asian organized crime cartels, and Mexican cartels. 
in debriefing defendants on the cases we prosecuted, we heard a consistent story, and that is they would tell us, these actual marijuana operators from these organizations would tell us, when you pass retail marijuana, you basically invited us into your state to be a theater of operation for production. We didn't have to produce in Mexico, we could, uh, or somewhere else, and come across the international border, we could produce right here in your state. And so finding a place to grow, planting, cultivating, harvesting, all of those things we could do under the cover of legalization, so we had much less risk. All we have to worry about is transporting it to a market back east. So that's why we're here. Uh, we had a case right before I left that involved black market, uh, an Asian organized crime group. We've taken over 950 houses, residential homes, converted them into greenhouses, uh, and we're making millions and millions of dollars harvesting and shipping back east. So uh, a lot of violence comes with those black markets, and a lot of increased law enforcement costs, both for the state agency that's supposed to be regulating and for local law enforcement, local sheriff's departments and, and, and police departments come from that, that black market activity. Um, another category, uh, and I want to get through this quickly enough that you have a little time for, for questions, but another category, you've got that public health stuff, You've got the black market impact. Um, another impact we've noticed is that these retail locations, these, these grows and these retail pot shops always end up in the most disadvantaged neighborhoods. Um, so the diverse communities who were told they would benefit in, in, in a social justice way from legalization, commercialization of marijuana have actually been harmed much more than white uh, privileged communities. Uh, the crime associated with marijuana uh, and you know the sights, sounds, and smells of grows and retail operations, uh, much like we, we've seen over history in this country with liquor stores, um, the, the folks who think that this is a great idea from a social justice perspective when it comes to voting locally on having a marijuana grow in their community never allow it in their white privileged community and they always end up in these disadvantaged struggling areas of the state particularly uh, in Denver we've seen that as a result in high schools in Colorado with the higher uh, percent of minority students. The suspension rates in those high schools for marijuana is 100% higher than it is for marijuana suspension in predominantly white high schools. Marijuana arrests for state law violations so it's still illegal in the state not to comply with the state rules or to possess more than an ounce of marijuana at a time or to sell it off the bar. Arrests for that kind of behavior for white have gone down 8% since commercialization. For African Americans, they've gone up 59%. For Latinos, arrests for marijuana violations have gone up 38% since commercialization. Uh, I don't know if you guys have issues, uh, have a mental health crisis in Vermont like we do here in Colorado, uh, but we've seen the development in those same communities of uh, mental health homeless populations who congregate in the vicinity of of um, high density marijuana establishments. And that, that population causes increased threat 
on government services and also on the neighborhoods, those already disadvantaged communities tend to be magnets for those folks, unfortunately. Uh, a, a final category that particularly in Colorado, because Colorado really has a lot of people here who care a lot about the environment, and they're here to enjoy the outdoors. Um, lots of outdoor environmental activity and, and impact on the environment here, and the change in the environmental culture here with commercialized marijuana has also been stark. Um, their public land officials and environmental officials here refer to commercial commercialized a pot as carbon cannabis because <coughs> harvesting cannabis in this environment where it's not naturally grown requires 17 times the per square foot electricity use. Okay, obviously you guys know, unlike some uh, voters, that uh, that Electricity, unfortunately, the largest percentage of electricity still comes from coal and fossil fuels. 17 percent, I'm sorry, 17 times per square foot the amount of electricity used in a residence is used in a marijuana grow and marijuana facility just for the lighting, just, just to do the heat light in a marijuana facility. Um, Marijuana also is a very thirsty plant. Colorado water is scarce. An adult marijuana plant requires 2.7 liters of water per day per plant. So there's a strain on water resources, a strain on electricity, and obviously the carbon products. Um, in grows whether they're indoor or outdoor or legal or not lots of pesticides are used and lots of mold is detected uh, in a recent sampling survey of pesticides and mold from just retail products these are products people can buy and ingest 93 percent of the samples tested in the survey contain dangerous levels of pesticides and molds. Uh, most disturbing here to me when I'm a U.S. attorney when we are charged with protecting our public lands. We had enormous, enormous outdoor illegal public land grows that we had never had here before, before commercialization. Again, because the illegal black market here is come into your state because they see the, the cover of legalization uh, provides less risk for them. So they grow lands, state lands, federal lands, and they use nerve agent pesticides. Nerve agent pesticides that get into the water system and get into the mammal food chain. Now these are pesticides that are literally used in less developed countries uh, to kill uh, lions, to kill javelinas, um, to kill large mammals, <coughs> threaten agricultural crop or livestock. Uh, and uh, they're showing up here in black bears, deer, elk, etc. They get into the food chain um, from rodents on up to the larger mammals. So those are some of uh, those are some of the impacts we've seen. That's life in Colorado now. Unfortunately, across those categories, in terms of benefits, so you look at those costs and then ask, okay, how do we balance that against benefits? Uh, the tax benefits here have not been what was promised. The total tax revenue from marijuana taxation is less than 1% of the state budget. The state spends a recent study from the Centennial Institute, uh, which did not even capture long-term health costs. Um, I, I forgot to mention a major, major long-term 
health impact that we've started to see manifest among adolescents. The risk of psychosis, so schizophrenia, psychotic breaks. Um, studies again and again have shown, studies published in The Lancet, laid out in great detail in Alex Berenson's book called Tell Your Children. The higher the potency of marijuana, the greater the increased risk of psychosis. There's a four to nine <coughs> time increase, four to, four to nine times more likely if you're using high potency marijuana as an adolescent then you're gonna have a psychotic break at some point in your future. Um, so this, this study that was done here about cost does not even include the cost of dealing with that, dealing long term uh, with a population with increased psychosis. Just the mitigation costs for law enforcement, um, hospitals, uh, emergency rooms, poison control centers, when you just look at those costs, it costs $4.57 to mitigate the impact of marijuana for every dollar brought in in, in marijuana taxes. So for every dollar you bring in, you're spending over $4 to mitigate the impact uh, that I've described earlier. Uh, we have seen about, right now, there are about 15,000 more jobs brought to Colorado uh, from the marijuana industry. That's out of millions of jobs in the state, an increase in 15,000. Uh, we've also seen across all uh, major sectors of employer, there was a study recently done of 20 different industry sectors, uh, which showed that a positive drug tests have been increased by a factor of three positive drug tests by employers have tripled since retail legalization. Those jobs, also those 15 or so thousand jobs I mentioned, uh, the vast majority of those, 90 plus percent of those, are $15 an hour jobs. Basically minimum wage, slightly above minimum wage jobs. So, uh, in terms of benefits, haven't seen it so much on the tax side or the employment side for the core workers in the industry. Uh, there have been approximately 12 already wealthy individual white males in Colorado who are the primary beneficiaries of commercialization. So a, a very few already wealthy people have gotten a lot wealthier. Uh, so that's one of the benefits. Um, it's much easier to get high now in Colorado. That's one of the benefits. Um, I'm not positive what system you have in place right now in terms of home growth, but a system where you had two, three, four plants for personal use and you decriminalize uh, up to an ounce of marijuana allows people uh, to get plenty high without having all of these other consequences I described. Um, but when you're weighing uh, those, those benefits and those costs, I would strongly suggest that you guys at least have state health officials, the state budget office, uh, whatever your state public safety offices are, uh, Highway Patrol, Department of Safety, whoever it is there in Vermont, but health safety and budget officials need to tell you guys before you make this decision how much it would cost, it's going to cost to create an entire new regulatory agency to govern this how much it's gonna cost you to create an entire new laboratory to test for mold and pesticides before this stuff is sold over the counter and people put it in their bodies. How much it's gonna to cost to have your own version of the Federal Drug Administration, I mean, uh, uh, the FDA. Uh, the FDA and the EPA do not regulate this. So 
the kind of regulation for the environment, public health that citizens are used to, used to getting from the federal government, they're not going to get. So you're going to need your own equivalent of the FDA, your own equivalent of the EPA. Um, police departments in metropolitan areas that have retail marijuana are going to need to have marijuana enforcement patrol divisions. That's happened in every state over up at every city in Colorado that has this. You're going to need to assess the cost of that. And then, of course, there's an increased load on treatment centers for drug treatment, treatment centers for mental health, hospitals, poison centers, and ER rooms. So emergency, sorry, ER rooms, emergency rooms. Um, that's six categories of things that have been major, major costs that drive that difference, that $4.50 versus $1 taken in. Colorado didn't look at any of those costs before <clears throat> approving the system we have here. Of course, we did it by popular vote, not by legislature. That's why it's great you guys are looking at this as a legislature and you can do that cost-benefit analysis and try to get an actual cost assessment on those things because those are six easy categories that you'll guarantee to have. It's a guarantee that you'll have a major increase in those costs and you'll need the new regulatory agency, the new lab, uh, a state version of an FDA and, F and EPA capacities, law enforcement control divisions, and those increased loads on especially mental health and, and hospital and treatment centers. So, thank you very much for um, for presenting your view of cost benefit analysis. Um, we have only about 30 minutes left on this subject here in committee this morning, and we have two more witnesses waiting to speak with us. Um, your presentation contained a lot of um, a lot of data and a lot of um, anecdotes, and I'm wondering if you could provide references to some of those to us. Um, I know that there are some very inquisitive minds around this table who might like to dig into some of the data and, um, and understand a bit more some of the anecdotes. Um, and so if you could submit that to our committee assistant uh, via email, I know that you have already been exchanging information with her via email. So that would be very helpful. Um, I'm, I'm going to give uh, you know just a couple of minutes for a few clarifying questions from committee and then um, if we have a number of lingering questions perhaps we can make an appointment to uh, to, to speak with you another time so how uh, mr. Troyer how much money is being spent for education and prevention in Colorado uh, I don't know I don't know that I don't know that specific. Um, I I can find that for you. Um, there is uh, there's some. Uh, yeah, I don't, I can find that specific easily. Thank you. JP, did you have a question? No. Uh, uh, could you follow up a little bit on that? What, do you know if they integrated when they set up the system? in your tax structure, dedicated money to go towards education and prevention issues? Yeah, they did. What, they, they did. What was that number, do you know? And I just don't know, you know, it's a small, uh, it's a small percentage of the money taken in, uh, and I just don't have the specific number, but that is part of the structure in Colorado, that money will be set aside for that. Um, it's not, I can, you know, I, I can tell you just in terms of the experience, if you came out to spend a week in Colorado, uh, your experience would be the industry uh, constantly present trying to get you to use it. You'd have to work pretty hard to find uh, anything publicly displayed on a billboard or in a school that indicated there was any kind of adverse impact. To, <laughs> or any effort at prevention. 
So uh, there are people who work hard at that. The actual money set aside from that is small. Thank you. So thank you for being with us this morning. Um, and uh, we will look forward to digging in a little bit more on some of those issues that you suggested. So thank you for sharing um, some uh, citations with us. Um, Happy to, happy to do it. Yeah, I'm happy to do it. And I'll get you the follow-up information on the statistics, but I'm also happy to talk in the future if you guys think it would be helpful. I, I admire the work you're doing, and I'm, I'm impressed. I wish in Colorado we had a group of people trying to be as thoughtful as possible of doing sort of a risk or reward analysis before going down this path. Thank you much for being with us. Thanks. Goodbye. So we have next on the agenda um, Kate Nugent from Winooski Partnership for Prevention. Thank you for being with us this morning. Thanks for having me today. Uh, my name is Kate Nugent, and I'm the Executive Director of the Winooski Partnership for Prevention. Um, I'm here as a resident of Vermont and a mom, also a community substance abuse prevention leader. Um, just, uh, that microphone mm -hmm. doesn't amplify your voice. Okay. You can talk a little sure. louder. Sure. Um, so I'm here because um, one of my core values in life is to leave the world a better place than how I found it. Um, and I think that's why I love Vermont so much, because I think that is a shared value that we all have. Um, and I especially uh, feel that way about um, kids. So I have always worked with um, kids in my, even when I was a young uh, preteen myself, I taught in various ways and have always worked with youth and throughout my career. So. It's something I'm really passionate about, and um, I think I'm here because I think I owe that to the next generation to speak what I know and share it with you. Um, so since being involved in this work in particular, I've um, seen a disconnection between what is known in the science and what is perceived in the communities around us. Um, I was in this state house a couple of years ago, and a world-renowned researcher, someone who has uh, under 20 patents to her name, has worked at, um, or has presented in front of the United Nations, um, is from Harvard, Dr. Bertha Madras. Uh, she gave a presentation um, here. And she talked about the wealth of knowledge that she had, that's her specialty, um, and her experience. And then um, she shared a little bit of emerging research. And it was, striking to me because when I read the article about it the next day, the summary was, we don't know a lot about marijuana. And I thought, you know, if you just read that article and you hadn't been in that room, that's what you would take away from that. And so that's what I'm hoping is to just lend a little bit of uh, more information to this discussion. And also my personal story. Um, so I have you know, friends who have lost their careers, um, their marriage has fallen apart um, through marijuana use. Um, in particular, one story that really affected me was a friend of mine in college um, was a, you know, sometime user of marijuana for a while and then, um, you know, started using it more and more. I think uh, used it every day after, you know, six months that I was, uh, that I first knew him. And then he was found in a river in central New York um, in the middle of winter, um, freezing. And he was unconscious. And luckily, he was um, rescued, and, but he had to leave school. So that um, really stuck with me. And I think we hear a lot of this narrative of like it's harmless. I think everyone in this committee doesn't think that at this point. but. Um, those stories, I think there's a lot of shame involved sometimes, people telling these stories, so they, they don't get out as much. Um, 
So, and I've you know worked with teachers and guidance counselors, parents and kids, pediatricians, doctors, law enforcement officers. That's the nature of what I do, um, and other nonprofit directors. And it always strikes me how much they care about their communities and how hard they work. You know, they're they're out at night. Um, just trying to make a difference with one more person. Um, and, you know, they're busy, so the resources are not as great for them as for these industry groups. But because of their hard work, I think you all know this because you're part of this, um, you know, we have a pretty good quality of life. It's not perfect, but it's all these things that are in the background. And these, these folks uh, deal with this, you know, the consequences of these things on a daily basis in their work. And many have asked them, asked you state leaders to prevent um, further increases of access to marijuana use by youth because they're seeing the consequences in their daily work. Um, I want to talk a little bit about tobacco prevention because I think that we have had a lot of success with that, and it's a good model to look at. But there's a lot of things that I don't think a lot of people know. One is that um, tobacco still takes eight times the number of lives in Vermont that opioids do. So it's about 800 Vermonters every year die from tobacco use versus about 100 from opioids. Um, and we have learned how to reduce the impact of addictive substances. But I want to emphasize that this is relative because before tobacco was mechanized and commercialized, rates of tobacco use were under 5% in the nation. And we have never since come close to that number. Right now, we're at an all-time low, and it's 14% of the adult population in, in the United States, which if this were any other disease, we would be, and in many ways, we do treat this as an epidemic that it is. Um, we were able to achieve these remarkable reductions because of 50 years of piles of research. Um, the first study that came out linking cancer to tobacco use uh, was, I think, about 50 years before the Master Settlement Agreement, where tobacco industry people still said nicotine is not addictive, and yet the states uh, were able to prove that. Um, because of that settlement agreement, we've had billions of dollars pumped into tobacco prevention in this nation. Vermont has done a great job using most, more of that money for prevention than other states. Some states have just absorbed it into their general fund. Um, and so we've done a good job with that, but um, it's not necessarily something that happens automatically once you have an industry set up. And it did not happen uh, willingly as you probably know. Um, so what worked for tobacco was increased education and restricting the promotion, marketing, access, visibility, and the impacts of secondhand smoke exposure. Um, in Vermont right now, we have promotion and sales of equipment and growing supplies. We have promotion um, that's been limited for dispensary medical use. Um, but I, that has been relaxed since the initial um, start of the medical marijuana. Um, we have private events that promote use, um, and we have the ability to grow and use at home for anyone under 21. Um, rates of marijuana use by youth are, are greater than we find acceptable. So among Vermont high school students, it's about 24% regular use. Uh, returning to the success of tobacco prevention, I think the ways that marijuana is currently regulated and how we could do better to protect our youth. 51% um, of Vermont high school students believe that there is no risk or slight risk in using marijuana. So that means only 49% think that there's a moderate or great risk. Uh, and that, those, as those perception of harm um, decrease, use tends to increase. Uh, if you want to compare it to alcohol, which is what the marijuana industry often wants us to compare it to, 36% um, of Vermont high school students believe that binge drinking on the weekends is harmful, and 33% report regular alcohol use. So 
right now both numbers are higher for alcohol than they are for marijuana. I think this should be our goal. Um, it's my goal is to reduce the use of marijuana. And if I were going to approach it that way, I would try to keep it from being used in front of kids. I would try to reduce exposure to secondhand marijuana smoke. I would um, have as many fun substance-free events and programs for youth as we could. Um, that helps people, that helps kids and it helps people in recovery as well. Um, I would keep it from being sold everywhere. I would try to make sure that it was harder to get at home by educating parents about putting it away out of harms or out of access or inaccessible. Um, I would try to make it not seem normal and attractive. Um, I would limit the promotion, especially of kid attracting colors, flavors, cartoon images, and promoting it in foods and candies. I think we don't sell Advil in baked goods, and Advil is a relatively benign drug, and I don't think we should be selling uh, cookies and gummy bears with THC in them. Um, I would also make sure that as many people as possible had the latest and up-to-date information about the health impacts of marijuana. Um, I've heard it said that it's a, it's, it's like the opposite of a steroid, it's a performance unenhancing drug. And uh, some of the stories that you will hear are um, heartbreaking, but I think the, in general, or and I think in general, that's kind of the most heartbreaking, but it's slow and, and uh, quiet. Um, and I think the good news is that we can do all of this today because it's not, hasn't been fully commercialized in Vermont. And I think we can keep marijuana from becoming the next alcohol for our youth. Um, people rarely develop addictions after the age of 21 if they haven't tried it before that. Ad, you know, addiction is an adolescent disease. And however, profits from the alcohol and marijuana industry are derived 80% from heavy users. So in order to profit, they need to addict youth. Um, it's, a big, it's a big business. I think the last thought that I wanted to leave with you today is that if we are to prevent drug use and addiction, we must stay hopeful and confident that this is possible. I think the greatest motivation to legalize and commercialize this substance has been the idea that it's inevitable. I think that argument is a distraction from our true goal, which is to have healthy, safe, and connected people. And just as we know it on an individual level, it's possible to protect youth from drug use and addiction. We know that it's possible to protect communities. Uh, Iceland has proved this to be possible. Their youth, drug use rates are below 5%. That took them 20 years from going from one of the worst, um, one of the most used, or where youth used the most to under 5%. Um, many, many, many communities in the United States have proven this to be possible as well. Um, and again, our people are our most valuable resource, and I think we need every single one of them to be as healthy mentally and physically as, as they can, because we need, we need everybody. So thank you for your time. Mike. Are you OK for questions? Oh, uh, sure. Yeah. Actually, I hope this is an easy one. <laughs> thank you for your work. Thanks. Um, one of the things we talked about a little bit here is, is the network of prevention programs around the state. Mm -hmm. You work for one of the, the local prevention coalitions. Mm -hmm. and, and what does that network look like around the state? How many are there? What kind of work they do? Who do they work for? Um, I, don't, I don't know if I can have the exact number of how many there are um, around the state, but there are seven to eight, I want to say. I think there's 17, um, but 17. I asked you a question, I think. But what's the scope of the work you do in, in your community? You're in Mm-hmm. Yeah. yeah. Um, when you say scope, could you explain what you mean? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Who are you working with? Where do you do the things you're engaged in? 
Um, what kind of what kind of programs do you have out there for community? We work with uh, everybody, local community leaders and youth, and um, you know, kind of people that I mentioned before, law enforcement people, and, uh, other people that serve uh, different functions in the community. So. Uh, treatment providers and counselors. When you talk about <coughs> uh, drug free events, is that something you also involved in? Drug and alcohol free events? Yes, yeah, if we do. I what, mean, what does something like that look like? Um, well, we might create a community dinner, something that we do often. And yeah. so it's like free and invites everybody in. And, uh, yeah, we have a speaker from another from another agency or something. Thanks. Thanks for your work. Thank you. Thanks for being with us. Thank you. So we have one more um, witness, and then we have a hard stop at ten forty-five because we have an appointment with um, a school teacher who's phoning in with us, and I suspect he has rearranged his day to be out of the classroom when. Uh, when we need to speak with him. So, Tim, you're going to have to help me with your last name. Trevithan. Okay. <laughs> uh, yeah. Madam Chair, before we begin, there's, so there's several students here who are invited down. I know the time is oppressing. Um, if I keep mine short, can we get their voice heard? We have a hard stop at 1045, so okay, I'm I'll do my to have best. you use your 15 minutes. I'm sorry that that's all. Yeah, no, I, I get it. Some of the other Appreciate people. it. Uh, so good morning, Madam Chair. Members of the committee, uh, I'm Tim Trevithick. I'm from CBU High School. I'm the Student Assistance Program Counselor and the SAP Counselor. Uh, I've been an SAP for 14 years. Uh, in my role, I support kids in uh, many ways. Really, 90% of my job is meeting one-on-one uh, -on -one with students uh, about any issue that they come in and want to talk about, whether it's suicide ideation, whether it's self-harm, whether it's substance use, their use, or someone else's use. Um, and uh, it's been a uh, really rewarding and taxing job. Um, I hear a lot of stories, I hear a lot of pain. Um, so I'm here today as an opportunity to actually talk about sort of the real world um, because I believe there's a disconnect. Um, there's a lot of rhetoric that you guys hear and will continue to hear. Um, and I want to talk about my students and what's happening in my building. Um, so I will have show and tell too. I will uh, use some props um, because I think it's important because that's the real world where our kids are in. Um, our schools are a microcosm of what's going into the larger community. Right? So if we have anger and angst in our world today, we're feeling it in our buildings. If we have hope, we're feeling it in our buildings. Um, if we have drugs in our community, it's in our buildings. Um, and so it's been an interesting shift in, in my 14 years. Uh, it's like South Brisbane High School right now, uh, they have taken their doors off their bathrooms. They're taking the doors off their bathrooms because of the jewel epidemic is so, so strong. They're losing the battle. We're losing the battle. Just the other day, I go walk in the bathroom, to go to the bathroom, and this kid's got a vape coming out of his mouth. Right? So I, hey, all right, let's go see the administrator. Um, and that was interesting. It was in between when I was talking to a class. So when I have the opportunity to talk to a class, I always ask the kids, I say, hey, how many of you guys want to be drug addicts when you grow up? As you can imagine, there's not a lot of hands go up. Ninth graders, probably just a couple of giggles, a couple of knuckleheads. Um, and then I ask, so how does it happen? If no one wants to be a drug addict when they grow up, how do we have drug addicts? You know, Kate talked about adult addiction starts in adolescence, and that's the reality, okay? So I've seen this shift in terms of the jewel. I've also seen this shift in terms of the marijuana. and. Um, it happened maybe about seven or eight years ago. Uh, I started talking with kids, and they are very open. Um, some of them are way too open with me, considering that I need to report some things, um, and some of them I report to the police. Um, so I started to see the diversion of medical marijuana uh, from Vermont. And I've talked about my rep with this. I've said this. I've created the you know, alarm, but no one listens. Um, and then uh, well, what I started realizing, one of my students, one of the most powerful drug dealers in my school, would actually get marijuana shipped from California, which was fascinating. Large amounts of marijuana from California. Um, and so we started seeing that. So I don't know if you guys have talked to the drug task force at all. Um, they would say that most of the marijuana in Vermont a long time ago came from Canada. 
right? Low THC, just like Bob was talking about, low THC, street level THC is really low, really range from six to 20%. Um, now, our kiddos get legal marijuana. We get legal marijuana in our building. And I'm gonna show you, Bob Troyer talked about um, these vape things. So these two dad pens, these are dad pens. This is legal for people with medical marijuana card in the state of Vermont. <laughs> Confiscated by an 18 year old and a 15 year old. Also, I want you to look at that THC level on that card. So what I've seen is a dramatic increase of excessive access and availability around high potency marijuana, mostly due to our diversion of medical marijuana. And, and, and Vermont touts and brags about we have a really, really strict medical marijuana problem. You're gonna be talking to Mr. Whalen this afternoon about that program, and he's gonna say we have a great program. But no one's asking questions and no one's listening. So my concern is that as we continue to liberalize marijuana, and I'm, I'm with all for decriminalization. In fact, the state actually saved money. But I'm not for commercialization, creating another industry that's going to create more access and availability for our kids. And I'm seeing it firsthand. I've seen the firsthand of psychosis. I've seen tragic death through car accidents. The first time I experienced psychosis is when this young man came in. He was a seventh grader when he started smoking pot. His mom's medical marijuana. He comes as a ninth grader, he gets three policy violations in the first four months. I got him to go to residential treatment once. Next time he's in my office, he's giggling, he's all messed up, and he starts talking about cats and aliens. And I'm like, dude, what are you on? He's like, oh, I took mushrooms, I ate mushrooms for breakfast. Ha ha ha, right? I'm like, okay, this sucks, I gotta take you down to the principal. I bring him down to Jeff Evans at the time. And I know this is his fourth violation, that chances are he won't be coming back or any back anytime soon. So we had that conversation. I get, get to my office the next day, and his dad uh, left a voicemail and said, Call me. So he call, I call him back, and he tells me what transpires. Ultimately, what transpires is that he gets in a physical altercation with his dad, gets transport, transported to the UVM Medical Center in a five point restraint. Then they do a talk screen, there's no psilocybin in his system. And then he goes down to a Broward retreat where he's diagnosed with many things one of them being cannabis and new psychosis. That was the first time I really started seeing it. We're probably losing two kids a year due to psychosis in our school because of high potency marijuana. Another time, I'll tell you this. So I got called from the social worker, right? And I, she's like, I need your help, Tim. I walk in, and this, this lady, this young lady who I knew, she's got yogurt all over her face, she's crying, she's laughing, and she's strumming the guitar. Clearly I walk into a psychotic break. Her father has a medical marijuana car, uh, card. Her brother used to, her older brother used to sell the medical marijuana. And so we bring it to the hospital, and indeed, they diagnose her with a cannabis and psychosis and psychotic break. Probably the worst tragedy that we've had at CVU, and we've lost probably nine kids per year. Every year I've been there, we've lost a kid. It was when this young man chose to get really, really high behind his car, kill himself, and a cyclist. That was probably the worst. And long-term psychosis, that's lifelong, right? Some of these kids have developed schizophrenia because of the pro prodromal phase of cannabis-induced psychosis can go away when you abate symptoms if you stop using. So I'm gonna end, I'm gonna end with this. And then hopefully, I don't know if we're going to have time for students. So I'm trying as quick as I can, madam. And dreams begin responsibilities, wrote William Butler, uh, Butler Yates. I'd like to believe that all adults care about fostering our children's dreams. Sadly, when I look out the world we have now, um, that we have created, it's clear to me that some adults care only about the immediate needs and are blinded by how their actions impact those of youth and the future generations. For those, of us, for those of us in education, we dream of creating environments where the minds and spirits of children can thrive. It is our responsibility to make that happen. That is a high calling of education, an urgent task of our time. I believe we are living in interesting times right now, both politically and socially, a world that is more, far, far more complicated than probably most of us in this room, when we grew up. 
There are several factors that are converging and impacting our kids, but will undoubtedly will grow in coming years. Picture a weather map, if you will, right, uh, with different fronts heading towards one another. Front one is social media. Front two is adults modeling a lack of responsibility and accountability. Front three is a celebration and creation of a new drug industry called marijuana that will target youth and already the less privileged. I am fearful that we as adults are creating a perfect storm for our kids. Thank you for your time. So um, to be respectful of your students, um, we have only five minutes, but I would welcome you if you're able to stick around because our 11 o'clock um, testimony, I suspect, is not going to take the entire hour. So we could, uh, we could possibly hear from your other students um, more like 11 30 or 11.45 if you're able to stick around. So do you have uh, a student who can do five minutes? Do you, do you want to go? And then Chris I'm saying something up. What's that? I'm just, I'll probably sum up. Okay, if you want to. Thank you. <laughs> Okay, so I'll probably just sum my up my name. And for the record, just give me your name. Oh, okay. Yeah. Uh, my name is Lucas. I'm from Winooski High School, ninth grade. I've been involved with the Above the Influence program at Winooski, Winooski for about three years now. And first, I just want to quickly give a personal experience. I'm just going to sum it up mainly. Uh, so my personal experience is mainly, I was, before I was born, my dad started using a lot of products. It started off with marijuana and alcohol. Then it slowly started to proceed when I was born, and it started to move to more hardcore drugs. And it started to turn into things like shrooms, and it turned more intensely into heroin. And so what ended up happening was he left me with some things, mainly medical, like thing, and some turned mental, and it mainly just had an effect on my life. And that's kind of what started to get me into things like this, too. So things like that can't happen to other people. So that's why I'm mainly here. I'm just going to sum up mainly what I wrote down. So mainly what I wrote down was marijuana does a lot more things than just make you high. It does affect your mental stability. Gives, it can give you physical illness, mental illness, and things like that. And the main thing I want to talk about is how it affects also kids who are not even using them. Uh, what can happen is there's a lot of second, not only second hand things that can happen like related to illness, it can also affect their mindset related to smoking. It can affect how they look at the drugs, thinking that the people they look up to, mainly adults, who are they're using them, make them look cool, or make them have any, like, it can outcome and make them want to use them. So mainly it's popularity, in my opinion. So, and they're becoming more and more open about it. People are becoming more and more open, which is leading to more kids wanting to use and other things like that usage. And it's starting to get kids interested. Well, I've noticed a lot in my bath, in the bathrooms at the school, kids won't even care if a teacher walks in while they're smoking marijuana. They'll just continue. So they'll, it just really affects their mindset on how kids are starting to increase in usage because they're noticing that adults and people they look up to are starting to make it more cool or just popular. So that's the main reason I really wanted to come in here and talk about that. And it starts to make them think that they have no consequences. So they should be seeing stuff like that, and it puts them at an early disadvantage, and that's my sum up, really. So committee, we have um, a teacher, Josh Knox, um, and so let me just help orient you. We are switching gears right now to come back to the issue around right to choice voting. This is a bill that we, um, the uh, courtesy introduction of uh, a week or two ago, and um, the ranked choice voting issue is one that has been adopted in Maine, and we have a Vermont social studies teacher who has a great deal of interest in it. So Kelly, you can go ahead and dial him up. Um, so we will hear first from the social studies teacher, and then I believe that the, uh, the 
president of Maine who's worked on the, the Maine rank choice voting system will be uh, coming into the room at some point soon. who are coming in the room who are also here for the same uh, conversation this morning or having a little bit of a changeover of folks as we switch gears to talk about ranked choice voting. Um, but I was intrigued by your, um, by your interest in the bill and I understand that you're a social studies teacher so um, please give Latin, us- Latin teacher. Uh, okay, excellent. So I do, I, do cover, I do cover Roman political. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Well, I'm sure there's a lot more there. Um, so we would love to spend about uh, 10 or 15 minutes with you. Um, and if you can leave some time for questions, uh, that would be fabulous. OK. So I was, um, Kelly told me the idea is to sort of read prepared remarks in and then give time for questions. Perfect. Good idea. Thank you. Go right ahead. OK. So thank you for um, giving me the chance to speak with you today. And I already said, my name is Joshua Knox, and I want to speak in favor of House Bill 444, ranked choice voting. I think it's important to tell you who I am and my reasons for supporting it. Thank you in advance for your indulgence. Um, although my day job is that of a Latin teacher at a public school, I ran in 2018 as an independent in the general election for one of the six at-large Chittenden County seats. I chose the state senate because of how strange its method of election appeared to me. Frankly, any ballot that offers 13 candidates and tells you to vote for six is going to be a bit confusing for the average voter, and she will probably default to party alignment or name recognition or some other shorthand. Even worse than lopsided elections, however, are elections that fail to generate popular interest. And I have to mention the thing that got me in the state senate race in the first place, the, the so-called wasted vote, or also blank votes. So a wasted vote, as you may have heard, is any vote that doesn't achieve its end. So any vote for a losing candidate. And a blank vote is, as the name implies, when a voter undervotes a ballot, meaning she leaves an office blank or votes for fewer choices than allowed. Of course, in the case of Chittenden Senate seats, it means voting for fewer than six. Uh, in 2016, the number of blank votes for Chittenden Senate was nearly 180,000 out of just over 450,000 caps. So if you add votes for losing candidates, we have over 220,000 votes that by this definition are wasted. That, that was nearly half of all the votes voted for Chittenden and Senate seats. So to be clear, although the delegation for the state Senate was 6-0 in favor of one party, Democrats or uh, Democrat progressives, there was very clear electoral evidence that half the voters withheld affirmative support from those candidates. And the important thing about this that got me really interested about the at large concept is it disadvantages whoever the minority party or interest is in a given place. So in Rutland County, 2016, the election for state senate was 3 to 0 Republican, despite the fact that Republicans, again, if we include blanks, obtained fewer than half the total votes. And every county with a three or more at large district had delegations of, of one party. So as a result, I decided to run for the state senate myself. Now, I'm not going to say I was a dynamo on the stump or incredible in a televised debate, but I do think I presented my ideas pretty thoughtfully. My main issue was, naturally, the negative effects of the way Vermont's legislature is elected, this first past the post system. And my slogan was what I thought was pretty catchy, no wasted votes. My big push was for a form of election reform, specifically proportional representation, whereby the division of seats would be equivalent to percentage of votes. That said, I wasn't a one-issue hobby horse kind of guy. As you all know, as a candidate, you receive a lot of surveys, solicitations for positions on particular issues, broader requests from the media. <clears throat> so I took time to fill out all the serious requests that I received, whether it was a general survey for something like Project Vote Smart, 
issue specific matters like affordable child care, education, legality of abortion, firearms, minimum wage, you name it, I probably filled it out and returned it. But at the end of the day, it didn't matter. As the deadline for responses passed, and I checked the various websites to see what the other candidates had said in order to compare our positions, be more informed myself, I discovered that only a minority had filled out all these surveys. Uh, my name is Kyle Bailey. I'm uh, from Gorham, Maine, which is right outside of uh, the city of Portland. I've lived in Maine for 10 years. I grew up in Georgia and Florida um, and uh, moved to Maine for a job and, and fell in love uh, with the state of New England. So uh, thank you all so much for having me here uh, today. I just really want to uh, walk through my presentations about, but first, I'm the campaign manager for the Committee for Ranked Choice Voting, which has worked for the last four and a half years in the state of Maine uh, to educate voters about ranked choice voting, uh, to work for uh, two successful ballot measure campaigns. We are a ballot measure state, as you know, to win ranked choice voting and to, to defend it. We're also engaged in, we were also engaged in multiple uh, litigation uh, situations uh, to defend the law and to require its implementation. And I also uh, led two uh, successful efforts to educate voters about using ranked choice voting in the June 2018 and November 2018 election. So, sort of, sort of what I bring to this conversation is real world experience. Um, educating voters about uh, ranked choice voting and implementing it uh, on the voter education side, as well as doing some work with clerks and the Secretary of State's office. So my goal is really uh, for today's conversation is uh, talk about wh what ranked choice voting is, how it works, and why it matters through the main experience. Uh, my goal is really to, to hopefully give you all some more information to consider about ranked choice voting and to elevate the conversation, and maybe even inspire uh, a few folks to be engaged uh, in this conversation and, and take a leadership role along with other legislators who've submitted this. Um, so I think the first place to start is, you know, what is, what is ranked choice voting? It's a simple, fair, and easy voting system that is now used in the state of Maine and in cities across the country, and as you heard from the previous speaker, in countries around the world. In fact, uh, a number of countries, uh, every voter uses it. And uh, it's a system that tackles some, uh, some challenges, which we heard the former speaker mention, and I'll get into that in just a little bit. But it's really important to sort of uh, look at ranked choice voting as a simple, fair, and easy, nonpartisan, consensus-oriented voting system that gives voters more voice and more choice. So let's talk about why that is. Uh, first, here's just a quick map of a place in the United States that either have ranked choice voting, that are considering their legislator, legislature. There are five southern states uh, that use ranked choice voting to accommodate overseas voters uh, in their actual runoff elections. So people use ranked choice voting in various different formats in different states and municipalities. And then uh, uh, across the world, there's many different uses, but six countries use it to elect their president. Australia has used it for actually over 100 years uh, for it to elect their uh, parliament. So when people say, you know, uh, in 1917, in 1917, there were obviously not computers or tabulators, so it was a hand count. So uh, this has been used for a long time. So how does ranked choice voting work? I thought it might be helpful just to look at a couple of examples from Maine. The first would be the 2018 Democratic gubernatorial primary, in which there were seven candidates uh, running. Uh, under the old pick one first past the post system, you know, you, you, you go in, you vote for a candidate, the candidate with the most votes wins. And historically in Maine, we've had nominees win from both parties, 30, 31, 32 percent of the vote. A lot of questions about were they, you know, were they really the consensus nominee? A lot of fracture within the party as a result of that. And uh, so we use ranked choice voting in the primary elections in Maine. Here's a sample ballot in that seven-way race. So instead of having one oval next to every candidate's name, you have the option to rank them from your favorite to your least favorite. So you can say, you know, this 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 candidate, I heard them in the debates. They were a rock star. You know, that I really align with them. They're my first choice. And then you look on down and say, this other candidate, you know, 90% of the time, I pretty much agreement with them. If I if my first choice couldn't win, I'd like to have them then win. They're my second choice. And so you can rank as many uh, candidates as few or as many as you like in this race with the write-in option as well. And I should say in your package you have sample ballots from Maine as well, actual sample ballots. So on election night, we add up all the votes to see who is everyone's first choice. Uh, and what we found in Maine in, in this race with seven candidates, uh, Janet Mills, who is our, our new governor, um, had the most votes. She had the plurality in the first round of tabulation in Maine, the most first choices, but she didn't have a, did not have a majority. And so the great thing about ranked choice voting is we want to find out, is, was she the consensus nominee for Democrats or did they have other preferences? And so in this race, we look to see the three candidates who are in last place, they have the fewest first choice votes, they're eliminated. Uh, none of them have a path to victory. But if you voted for one of those candidates, your vote's not wasted. We literally pick up your ballot and look to see who's your second choice. 
who do you like best between the remaining four candidates? And we count the votes again. So we see that each candidate sort of gained a little bit from those voters who were elim those those uh, uh, candidates who were eliminated. Uh, but you know, uh, Janet's still in the lead, but she doesn't have a majority. So we look to see the last place candidate, former Speaker of the House Mark Eves, you know, is eliminated. He's in last place. We look at every all the voters who voted for Mark Eves and say, who do they like best between the remaining candidates? We move those ballots to the pile for the remaining candidates. Again, added to each. Uh, candidates tallies, but uh, Janet Mills continues to be in the lead, but still not quite a majority. So the last place candidate in this situation, Betsy Sweet, is eliminated. We pick up those ballots. Who's the remaining uh, favorite candidate among those voters? And it confirms Janet Mills is, in fact, the consensus uh, nominee for the Democratic Party for governor and wins with an outright majority. Um, when you go back to the initial ballot, why did you mm -hmm. eliminate three and not just one? Great question. So when you look at these three candidates at the bottom, even if you tally all of their votes together, even if they sort of aligned, so uh, you'd still be less than the fourth place finisher, Mark Eves. They, there's no path to victory. So you can do you can do it one at a time. It's called batch elimination. Well, yeah, I know, but how do you know that the one, two, three, the fifth place guy didn't have yeah. wasn't the second choice of everybody sure. else yeah, yeah so let me just let me just say so donna dion finished last place followed by diane russell followed by mark uh mark dion even if everyone who liked donna dion and diane russell made mark eves their next best choice and he got all those votes he'd still be behind the fourth place finisher mark eves so he there's no mathematical okay. path to victory all right so it. we so, so both for presentation yeah. and the election system we okay. simply batch eliminate them so, so that's a great question so if he was able to have a path yeah, he continued to advance. It wouldn't have been eliminated. Right, but you put it in the bottom one. That's the right. Two. And with ranked choice voting, you uh, you ballots are counted in rounds in which last place candidates lose until yeah. one candidate reaches a majority and wins. Right, got it. So I've got one more. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, yes, sir. Uh, hold on, I've sure. got a cue going. Uh, Rob, and then Bob, and then Nelson. Um, um, could you back up to the screen where you had your your clear winner? Yes. I mean, I don't know if that totally represents mathematically, but. Would there be a scenario there where neither one of them got 50% of the vote? No, because you'll always have a majority of votes cast in the final round of tabulation. So there are some voters, let's say, just pulling back the original, I've got one more example too, it's a smaller candidate race to look at. There, so Donna Dion finished in last place in this scenario. There may be voters who walked in the voting booth and said, I only want Donna Dion and to heck with everybody else. I, what's called bullet voting, right? I just right. voted for her. And so what, what happens is if you're a voter, your vote counts for Donna Dion, she loses, it's done. No different than the system we had previously, but you're choosing not to participate in the subsequent rounds of tabulation. It's just, it's just like if you had an actual runoff election four weeks after a date, and you decided not to show up because you didn't care at that point. Who won? So to follow up on that though, so if you had a significant amount of bullet voting, mm -hmm. I mean, it, it is conceivable that, that the top two candidates might not reach that figure. You always right? get a majority of votes cast in the final round of tabulation. So what it is is uh, it, there are some voters who decide not to participate, just like an actual runoff election. What we find, though, and, and we can talk more about this if you want to, the, uh, so ranked choice voting when compared to something like actual runoff elections, you have 10 percent higher voter participation with ranked choice voting than asking voters to come back to the polls four weeks later for a runoff election between the top two. Uh, to get that majority. So it's just a more efficient way to conduct a, a runoff, which you um, often need to get a majority winner in a crowded race unless someone is very popular and, and surpasses that goal. Let me show you one more example I think might be helpful. And let me let me just say, to answer part of your question, uh, voters' attitudes, there was uh, exit polling in Maine. 85% of voters were very familiar or familiar with ranked choice voting by the time they used it the first time. 84% found ranked choice voting very easy or easy to use. 95% of voters in that Democratic primary ranked candidates, they participated in ranking, turnout was 7.5% higher than the previous competitive Democratic primary for governor, and the spoiled ballot rate, which is um, over votes or challenges with the ballot, was comparable to pr past first past the post election. So on the back end and the voter reported data, uh, we saw positive indications about implementation. Let me show you another example. Uh, 2018, the congressional general election in Maine, in Maine's second district. Um, here's the sample ballot. There were four candidates, a Democrat, a Republican, and two independents. Voters had the option to rank their choices in order of individual preference. Uh, on election night, the votes were tabulated, um, and Jared Golden, the Democrat, received 45% of first choice rankings. Bruce Pollock, the Republican, received 46% of first choice rankings, and the independents received a total of 9% of the vote. 
Um, again, to my similar example, the independents are eliminated. Neither one has, neither one can get to a majority, even if they both crossed over and supported each other. And so we pick up those ballots to see who is their um, their second choice between the remaining candidates, or who do they like best between Jared Golden and Bruce Paulquin. In this case, it's one of the 10% of the time we find that it actually reverses the outcome or changes the outcome of the election because of ranked choice voting. In this case, um, the Jared Golden received two to one the preferences of voters who like the independent candidate. So it actually, uh, Congressman Jared Golden won with 51% of the vote uh, to Bruce Poliquin's 49%. Uh, in this election, 74% of voters said very easy, easy to use. It was interesting too, 62% of voters um, said that they thought uh, having majority winners was very important in Maine's elections. 95% um, of voters participated all the way through to the final round of tabulation in this congressional race as well, and the school ballot rate was comparable. So, um, any questions sort of on the mechanics? Um, Bob, or, or we can save at the end. <coughs> no, go ahead. Okay. I noticed that if you go back to where you did the rankings of the numbers, this is fine here. When you're done and you count the number two vote, it's only for the people that you removed. So, from it, or it does mm -hmm. the number two vote for the people that. No. Nope. So, if you voted for Jared Golden or Bruce Poliquin in the round, your candidate's still in the race. So your vote always counts for the candidate you're ranked highest. So your, your first choice is in that race, you're sticking with your first choice all the way through. And your vote only counts for your second choice if your first choice is eliminated. That's right. So why does ranked choice voting matter? Uh, so ranked choice voting restores majority rule. Candidates who are opposed by majority can't win. It allows voters to sort of build that coalition. Uh, it's the most cost-effective and efficient way to conduct a runoff, as I said. And it gives voters the freedom to vote for the candidate they like the best without worrying the help to elect the candidate they like the least. We heard this from the gentleman who called in. So from the voter's perspective, you never have to vote for the lesser of two evils when there's another candidate you really like. Um, you never have to feel like your vote is wasted because maybe you gave it to a candidate that didn't seem like you could win. But you can still then participate in electing your, 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 your representative or, or governor or whatever the case is be. And then what we find too with ranked choice voting encourages more positive issue-focused campaigns. Um, so you can't simply win with 30, 35, 40 percent of the vote. You've got to really reach beyond your base, uh, appeal more broadly for support, talk to voters who may like another candidate better, and have a conversation about the issues and find commonality and say, you know, if I can't be your first choice, I really hope you'll, I, can I count on you, to, will you rank me as your second choice? So a really interesting sort of collaborative conversation that now I think our current system doesn't encourage, it encourages sort of, uh, the incentives are to sort of rally your base and turn them out to vote. And this. Uh, not that you don't want to have a base and rally to the vote, you do, but you also want to think about reaching out beyond that. And negative campaigning can backfire when voters have the option to rank candidates too because you, know, you may not rank a, a candidate as your second choice if they slung mud at your first choice, and so there's some backfire in there. Why? One thing that I like about this is it, it, it seems to eliminate the need or the desire to cast bullet votes. Mm -hmm. uh, Jared Golden would be a prime example, they finished second in the first round. Uh, if, if there were only bullet votes, he, well, there would have been no second round. Yeah, I mean, the Bruce Baldwin in this, this particular race was the plurality winner in the first round. So per, perhaps he would have won in a plurality race. Who knows if the other events would have run. There's a lot of different variables to consider. But you're right. So think about the voter experience. Mm -hmm. You walk into the voting booth, and instead of having to think, what do the polls say? You know, do I need to vote strategically? I don't want to waste my vote. You know, you can walk in and say, you know, I really like this candidate the best. I agree with them. I want to rank them my first choice. But if they can't win, I sort of ha I have a second choice, and I have a say in who my leader is. And, and I know that, along with my neighbors, a majority of us will achieve a consensus about who our representatives should be. And that that's a different um, power dynamic than I think we've seen uh, in other races. And so I just uh, could have been closing this part. Um, I also would say, you know, that I think we all agree we have a responsibility to vote to make our state and our country a better place for our children and grandchildren, and ranked choice voting really is a change that gives more voice um, to the people. So happy to stop there and take any further questions about the main experience or ranked choice voting generally or the impact. Jim? So that example you gave with your congressman, mm -hmm. um, are there any Obviously, because the person who got the most votes in the first round did not end up winning. Right. Are there any uh, challenges to that uh, based on that this is a federal election, mm -hmm. which might 
be different than, say, a state office? So great question. So this has been challenged in federal court. Uh, Bruce Poliquin brought uh, litigation, sort of throwing everything at uh, ranked choice voting, and the U.S. District Court in Maine fully upheld um, ranked choice voting, and as did the First Circuit uh, in Boston. So it's sort of been litigated. There's another, another uh, case that came out of um, uh, the, I think the Ninth Circuit, where they also upheld RCV on a constitutional ground. So this has sort of been vetted uh, with the U.S. Constitution uh, without any challenges. Okay. So can you um, clarify what office is, this mm -hmm. is for? So in Maine, we use it for primary elections for governor, uh, U.S. Senate, U.S. House, state Senate, and state House. So the state races and federal races. In the general elections, we use it for U.S. Senate and U.S. House of Representatives at the moment. We have in our constitutional plurality provision that we need to amend in order to use it in the governor's race and in general election for the legislature, which a handful of states have language similar to ours. Well, we have language for some of the constitutional. That's correct. That yeah. Work. My understanding is you, you may need to amend your constitution to use it and more yeah, broadly. A simple choose. process. Yeah. So. Hmm? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Rob has a question. Um, can you speak to the cost? Of doing this compared to the more traditional is it is it more cost effective is mm -hmm. it more expensive so for Maine Maine had plurality first past the post elections no runoff system uh, it was estimated that ranked choice voting might cost 1.5 million dollars to implement mm -hmm. statewide um, and voters heard that argument and and voted for it and when it came time to actually implement it it took our Secretary of State about two and a half three months to implement it at a cost of about a hundred thousand dollars to Maine taxpayers um, so it ended up being very cost effective. The alternative, uh, which we commonly talked about, was if you want if you want to have a majority, which seemed to be the consensus of Maine voters, you have to do an actual runoff election, which could cost the state and, and localities up to a million dollars more. So the way we were able to structure it in Maine is the state picked up the tab for hundred thousand dollars to implement. There was no additional cost or administrative burden uh, for town clerks. So the hundred thousand. So the hundred thousand is in addition to what. Mm -hmm. it's a, it was a, and most of that was startup costs. Okay. So we have a we, the vendor we use for our tabulators it needed a simple software upgrade. The on the only ongoing costs for ranked choice voting in Maine are printing additional ballots to accommodate increased voter participation, um, and hiring a few staff for a couple of weeks to help with um, all the tabulation system just to make sure everything is tabulated properly. So those are the costs that are somewhat minimal. Thank you, John. So I'm looking at the fiscal note for Maine, mm -hmm. um, which indicates a cost of more than $100,000 per election. Right. So That's the fiscal note from the Citizens Initiative. That's right. Which is, no, it's not the actual cost. The actual cost was $100,000 to implement. So these numbers of $761,000 was not what it cost? Nope, it was not. Okay. Yep. Jim. Did you have a question? Yeah. <laughs> Would you like to share? <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure you say no. <laughs> you don't have to yell at her. <laughs> That's what my kids would say. You're yelling. There's a first for everything. Yeah. <laughs> Would you like me to jump in? Yeah, I, I have a question as well. Um, so I've done recounts on, on elections here mm -hmm. in Vermont, and our, our ballot, I think, is pretty straightforward. Um, but it is stunning to me the, uh, the number of times you see a ballot that has been spoiled. And so I'm just absolutely intrigued mm. um, at how you got such a low rate of ballot spoilage given the many opportunities there for somebody to miss a mm -hmm. circle or accidentally rank two people as their third choice. Um, I would assume that that would disqualify a ballot. So that's a great question. I, I can point you to research not only around Maine where our rates in two elections were comparable, but actually cities across the United States have found that ranked choice voting spoiled ballot rates are comparable compared to uh, pick one first past the post or top two in California. Uh, spoiled ballot rates. So what, what was interesting, when we when we went and knocked on 150,000 doors and talked to Maine voters and showed them the ballot, you know, they're, they're, sometimes their initial reaction was, oh, you know, 
I get that, but I'm not sure my neighbor will be able to get that. It might be too confusing for them. You know, and then they show them the ballot, and they're like, yeah, I totally get that. I can do that. I rank choices. We rank choices every day, right? You know, if, if deciding what restaurant we want to go to to dinner with our family, with, you know, your first choice, my first choice. Sometimes we compromise. Sometimes we insist. Uh, but, you know, that's, that's, the, that's the nature of it. And when we show people the ballot, they thought it was very easy. And so... And we heard this feedback, too, from people who were, including people who were not supportive of ranked choice voting, that they thought the ballot was uh, easy to use. Um, so that was the self-reported feedback from voters. And I think the, the back-end data, that spoiled ballot rate, just confirms what voters uh, were expressing about their experience with RCV. Uh, one of the concerns we heard was hand counting uh, at the local level. Mm -hmm. We have, I don't know towns that still hand count ballots. Um, do you have any towns in Maine that hand count and how was this addressed? So most of our towns in Maine still hand count. Only our okay. only towns of a thousand or more um, are provided tabulators through the Secretary of State's office with HAVA funds. Um, and so uh, with ranked choice voting the way we used it in our state, uh, uh, this, the Secretary of State came up with a blueprint or roadmap that was similar to the way we would do a recount. So on election night, the town clerks report out the first choice rankings in a race. Who do voters like all the best? Then the Secretary of State's office did the work of aggregating the cast vote record. So from the tabulators, the cast vote record was produced and delivered uh, to Augusta. And then from the hand count towns, the, the ballot boxes, you know, which had 100 ballots in them or 200 ballots in them, were taken to the Secretary of State's office. And they ran the statewide tabulation for um, the primaries and federal races in the November So the election. towns didn't actually... It was no more burden for the towns. It's just, right? It was all pushed to the state. It was on the Secretary of State, yeah. And, they, and uh, the first time we did it, which is the first time ranked choice voting has been used in this way in a state, it took 10 days to finalize the tabulation. I think that process is speeding up in our state. Uh, but we sort of have a, uh, uh, in, in some ways, sort of a system that we've used for decades that sort of is the way that we've approached elections. So, uh. okay. thank you. Mm -hmm. How? So you mentioned that you had to increase uh, the number of ballots that you printed. Mm -hmm. So what has been the increase in terms of voters? So in the primary election, uh, the increase was 7.5% uh, participation as in the Democratic primary. The Republican primary also had uh, increased voter participation. That was a five-way race. Uh, with which the winner got actually an outright majority uh, and didn't need to go to the ranked choice tabulation. And then in the general election, um, Maine is consistently one of the highest turnout states, so the impact in the general was sort of minimal. Uh, but of course, there was broad uh, voter turnout in, in, in November of 2018 across the country in most places, so we experienced a similar dynamic. Um, and so ranked choice voting is sort of, if you look at cities that use it as well, it's somewhere between a 5 and 10% on average voter turnout increase. Um, and so uh, we've seen that. We've also seen other places that, you know, when you couple it with other reforms, sometimes you, you that, mo that needle moves up a little higher as well. Thank you. So we have um, our Deputy Secretary of State in the room with us, and I wonder if I might put him on the spot and see if he has any thoughts that he'd like to share with us. Can I do it from here? Sure. What's going on? Thank you all very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Stick around, Kyle. Yeah, I'm not going anywhere. I'll hang out right here because you have more questions. Thank you. Good morning. For the record, Chris Winters, Deputy Secretary of State. Our elections director sends his regards. He has a sick child at home and uh, no coverage, so he's there and holding the bucket, I think, is how he was describing it this morning. Too much information, sorry about that. Um, I have very high level um, sort of concepts to put in, in front of this committee. Um, it would be preferable to have Will Senning back, I think, to talk about the details, but uh, as this committee, I think, is aware and, and should be aware, there are practical implications to this very large change in how we would do our elections in the state of Vermont. Um, you heard a little bit about the number of uh, towns that we have. Uh, I think it's 135 who have tabulators of, of the 246. It's 80% of the total votes, um, so there, there are things in place. Um, we would um, probably not take the approach that Maine did, which was to have to transport 
uh, this is the committee's decision, but to transport to a central location. You heard that really significantly delays election results, and we've become very used to election night reporting and knowing the night of the election who won uh, our different races. So that's something for you to consider, that trade-off there, if you do the central transporting and counting of votes to the uh, state level, to the Secretary of State's office. Um, without uh, every town having a, a, a new tabulator uh, capable of doing this, that um, you're going to see a delay in the, in the results being reported. It is a fundamental overhaul. We would require a replacement of all of our tabulators. Um, the good news on that is we're planning to do that anyway. Our tabulators are aging out, and it's time for us to upgrade. Any upgrade to our tabulators, we would want them to have the capability to do ranked choice voting. And I should have let off of this, but I will say that the Secretary Condos has always been a proponent of ranked choice voting. He still supports the concept, but he just wants the legislature to be very aware of the practical implications and the cost involved in moving in that direction. Not to mention that what we think would, should be a very massive voter education and, of course, uh, poll worker and clerk training that would have to come along with such a shift in the way that we do our elections. So those are my very high-level um, talking points on that. Uh, and again, would invite you to have the, the secretary and the director of elections in at some point to talk about this. Jim? It sounds like, I don't want to read into what you're saying, but it sounds like you think it will cost more than 100000 I think it would cost more than 100000 in Vermont, yes. So, I mean, I mean, well, this all seems very simple. Um, it's actually very mathematical. Um, has the Secretary of State's office done any study of whether ranked choice voting mathematically is better than the current way we elect um, officials to state office? Mathematically. Yes. No, there's a whole body of research on this. And so I was just wondering if you had looked into it. I mean. Um, there's arrows and possibility theorem. Um, I was just wondering if you at all looked into the conclusions that, that were reached based on that theorem and ranked choice voting. I, I haven't personally, but I'm sure that Will Senning has, and I, I can convey that question to him and uh, have him get back to the committee. Thank you. Any other questions for either um, Kyle or for our Deputy Secretary of State? Um, okay, so I want to start off, I'm going to do that. <laughs> I want to start off by saying uh, we are very thankful for this opportunity to share our thoughts. My name is Christelle Tanoki. I am a junior at Champlain Valley Union High School. I am here with my friend Akush Dow, who is a senior, also from CVU. We came to speak on behalf of our peers. The CVU, if you ask other students, is not only said to be a school full of rich, preppy kids, but a school with a serious drug problem. CVU has had numerous car searches due to students possessing drugs in class. Students have been suspended because they were caught dealing marijuana to sophomores and freshmen. This serious drug problem, is it really a CVU problem or is it a community one? According to the Vermont Department of Health, national data shows that more Vermonters ages 12 and up are using marijuana compared to the country overall. The number of Vermonters who try marijuana for the first time between the ages of 12 and 17 is also higher in our state than in the country overall. Today's high potency weed has 90% plus THC. Clinical studies reveal that long-term moderate consumption of the drug impairs short-term memory, slows reaction time, increases the risk of heart attacks, and can result in birth defects, strokes, and damage to the respiratory system and brain. Furthermore, the National Research Council has concluded that the long-term use of marijuana may alter the nervous system in ways that do promote violence. No place serves as a, as a better example than Amsterdam. Though often treated as a well-functioning city with a relaxed attitude towards drugs, Amsterdam is also one of the most violent cities in Europe. The future rests on the shoulders of this generation. Let's ask ourselves, is this really going to benefit the minds of our budding leaders? Are these risks worth the financial benefits of a few individuals? Is the money worth putting our future at stake? These are not just my questions, but the questions of the students I go to school with. Believe me when I say that this bill is not in our favor, and we gravely fear the repercussions we will have to endure if the reality of our concerns are disregarded. 
I am a minor and I'm concerned for my future, but I'm also in fear because of the skin I was born in. It has been said that marijuana commercialization will help promote social justice. I disagree. Here are some key takeaways from smart approaches to marijuana.org. Legalization has been heralded as a way to reduce the number of people of color incarcerated, yet despite reductions in the arrest for marijuana possession in states that have legalized, the prison population has remained stable. Residents in lower income communities of color already have the blight of a liquor store on every corner. The reality of legalization and commercialization is that these same communities will now be burdened with an oversaturation of pot shops on every other corner as well. Where there are issues of systemic injustice and racism, legalization does not address the root of these issues and instead only helps these problems by promoting increased drug use and the accompanying negative social consequences in disadvantaged communities. So I ask, instead of creating an industry, let's create opportunities. Instead of creating an industry, let's work to create a strong community that's healthy, safe, and drug free. Thank you. Thank you. Good job. Jim has a question. Jim. 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 Sorry. Sorry. <laughs> Believe me, I know the feeling when you're in that witness chair, you want to get out. <laughs> Been there, done that. Um, thank you very much. You um, you did a very nice job. Thank you. Um, I, I want to, how old are you? I'm 16. Okay, so I want to um, put you in the perspective of a 16-year-old in the future of Vermont. Mm -hmm. It's been sort of suggested, you know, some of us older types need to relook at the way we do things and need to attract a um, make Vermont attractive for young people to stay here um, in create opportunities. I mean, we have a demographic issue. Yes, we do. There's too many like me, especially this one next to me. Um, 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 so anyhow, it's been suggested that doing things that perhaps a younger population might be more attractive to, that could be uh, commercialization of marijuana, will help our demographic long term. It sounds like you disagree with that. I do. I don't believe that. Um, I guess my first, like, this bill was summed up to me. It was, we're going to, like, commercialize and legalize this to help a lot of things. But, and the, also the mindset behind it is it's already, like, it's already going on. We already have people with drug issues. So, like, kids like it. I guess people like it. So why not continue to provide, um, to give access, access to these kids so they can stay? But we, we don't want it. <laughs> we don't want it. And that's why a lot of kids, like, all the kids in my class and in my school, like once I'm 18 or once I graduate, I'm out. Like I'm, I'm leaving Vermont, and not just because they're um, um, people that <laughs> look like you, but because like Vermont is just. There's nothing wrong with the, you know. People. <laughs> no, right. <laughs> I mean, clarify right, that. Right. For the <laughs> it's not <laughs> him. I, you know. <laughs> um, it's not, and I'm just gonna say, at least for me, not just a diversity thing, but like is Vermont what's best for me, for my education, for yeah. my younger sister. Like, I fear, like, if we do this, my younger sister, what we, what kids worry about, and it's sad, but what they were, like, have been worrying about since when you guys were going to school, which is not too long ago, but, like, <laughs> yeah, but, Good recovery. <laughs> is popularity. And I, like, personally, I just don't believe drugs, like, will help me in any way. I don't need to jeopardize my future that way. But my younger sister, you know, she's young and she's popular, she's 10. I can't control what she does or what she tells me. So she might try because on the bus, we've already had like younger students, like, you know, 10th graders already like exposed to these products on the bus. Like they get it from their older siblings or I don't know, parents, but like it's already a problem and that scares me so much. So if I can move her away from this and other younger kids away from this, I will gladly do so. So for us to stay in Vermont, this cannot happen. That's just my Yeah, view. no, no, I, I very, very much appreciate okay. uh, that perspective. Thank you. Um, just for the record, I totally agree with your statement about it. <laughs> <laughs> so, Crystal, thank you so much for sharing what you shared. Um, so, what do you think is missing in school life and community life that, that leads so many young people to be attracted to marijuana? 
just from like speaking as like just a student, um, I would just say, hard question. Um, just more like issues with like themselves. You know, these days the way like we commercialize drugs and the way like social media like promotes drugs, it's like this will help with anxiety. This will help with depre depression. This will help. I don't know, make you just feel relaxed overall. And so a lot of kids like come to high school with all these expectations, like this generation is a little crazy, you know? So we just wanna do whatever we can to like go disappear into like an alternate like reality. I feel like that's what drugs do for kids. So like it's just like that's how they get stuck, you know? They they do that and then they think that it's helping them, but really in the future it's just gonna mess them up. So it's nothing that like I feel like it's something that like we can do to like help kids not um, go to drugs except like limit access to it like it's just like family and friends and like our just our personal like mm -hmm. adolescence mind kids these days you know so it's just so, so it sounds like there's a lot of stress that yes you just like you know, it's like school at college just like yeah. boys just stress so it's not <laughs> <laughs> it's not <Okay>. yeah gotcha. <laughs> gotcha. <laughs> okay. so no problem Rob um, <clears throat> first off you and your I guess schoolmate have done an excellent job. You're doing a very, very good job, but it's tough sitting there. We've talked a lot about prevention um, and education. What would that look like from your perspective? What do you think need would have to happen to help address the concerns that are out there around this? Um, I just say just a lot of like just uh, awareness around why drugs are bad. Cause like kids, like we know drugs are bad, but like that's that is what I mean when I say they're like addicted. Cause like I'll be like, I'm around all the time. See, I'm telling you, drug problem. And it's like, oh, like we know it's bad, but like it just feels so good. Like I just gotta clear my mind. I have a test. Let me just do this, you know. So for me, I remember Dare. Like, in, do we know what Dare is? Like, the, I don't know what it stands for. But like Dare, I was, I don't know. Dare like fifth grade where like. They came in and it wasn't really like marijuana they talked about. I think it was just like alcohol mostly and I guess cigarettes. I don't really remember. But it was just like we signed a whole, we signed a thing, a waiver, whatever, promising that we wouldn't ever try the way that people broke this um, the waiver. But I, I don't know. I just like stuck to it because the health risk and society, like just thing, the risk weren't worth like just myself. Like I just don't see, I don't know, it's just safe. It's just not safe. So I feel like we should just try our best to raise awareness around safety issues surrounding like drugs. Uh, we think because so many people are doing drugs that it won't make a difference, but I truly believe that it will. Especially, and we need to start in like younger communities such as like elementary schools. Like, we shouldn't think, oh, they're young, so they're not ready, or they're not trying. They're, they're thinking about it. They are, so we should start there and move to high schools. Like as much as we, like, because we're discussing like really putting like pot shops in Vermont, and we already have a problem. We need to talk about why this isn't, why this is bad. Like as much as we can, always talk about why this is bad. Very good, thank you. No problem. Nelson? <clears throat> How much do you think, of, based on peer pressure itself, you know, kids in school want to have their, their various groups and so forth, uh, and what happens sometimes, in fact, in my youth, when I was kind of not the best kid in school, uh, <laughs> You would do something to attract the other kids, and then all of a sudden they would do the same because they wanted to be part of what you were part of. Uh, do you see a lot of that happening, or is that am I off track there? That's no. That mentality has stuck, and I am sure will stuck throughout you know years of like schooling. But with drugs, like I'm just trying to think of like school drugs. I don't think that. I mean. Because for me personally, like I don't, I can't fall into peer pressure. Like if I don't want to do it, I'm, I'm simply not going to do it. But other people who do st strive to be popular and who aren't sure of themselves might, you know, try it due to their friends trying it. But then again, that goes back to like their own insecurities and their own anxieties and their own maybe if I do this, I'll be like this. But we already, like, we've already ruined it for them by letting them have these drugs, by giving them access to these drugs in the first place. But like answering your question, it has a little bit to do with peer pressure, but like. Everything has to do with peer pressure, from like sex to to drinking to cheating, like to um, fighting. Like everything has to do with peer pressure when it comes to like kids or even adults. So 
peer pressure is a part of it, but it's not the main like problem. How, how do you think that we would be able to, from an educational point of uh, changing the, the nature of uh, how people, younger people think when they come in and trying stuff like that? Is there something that we, you know, can do in a way of uh, funding or otherwise that would change that? in any way, give kids more opportunities in something different, or is there anything different that we can offer? Um, oh, well, I wasn't ready for these questions. I, <laughs> <laughs> um, you can find um, a friend if you want to. Friends <laughs> sitting right on the <laughs> Tim had, like, um, every, like, all around our school, we have posters, like, oh, in the bathroom, like, in the stall, it's like, the same bacteria, bacteria and nasty stuff that's in the toilet is, is, is in your vape pen, blah, blah, blah. Because cause people, like, they go to the bathroom to do this thing. They go out on their car to do this thing. So, I don't know, Tim, do we, friend, phone? Do you want to defer to me? I mean, you're... Phone, friend. <laughs> <laughs> do you want me to answer your question from my perspective, or... Sure, sure. Your, 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 you... From your perspective, you, you have to work with it every day. So. Right. Um, there's a number of things in, you know, there's a lot of countries who are doing some great things. You've heard about the Iceland model, right? Um, there, we actually, as a state, have done tremendous, tremendous work. We've done tremendous work. So if we go back to the 70s, you know, the rates of use were up here, around 40%. And then they dropped down, they're dropping down. 90s, they picked up a little bit, and then they're dropping down. So when, when people talk about 24%, I always reframe that with my kids. Right? So that means there's 66%, is that the one with the random? 76% of kids who actually are making healthy choices most of the time. So there's a reframe that we need to do, and, and a positive reframe, because most of the time our kids are making healthy choices. Um, the reality is, no matter how much money, so back in the day, Governor Douglas uh, supported a lot of funding for prevention. Uh, we had 110 SAPs in schools. There was 17, there's more than 17 coalitions. There's a lot of programs that got cut um, in the past 10 years, prevention. Um, and so what we've learned, and I think uh, Evie Morehouse, uh, I don't know if she's presented, um, but they talk about a third space, right? So you got home, school, and a third space. Um, in particular in Iceland, right? They figured out that nothing, ha nothing good happens after midnight. <laughs> and so they have a curfew, but they actually follow through on the curfew. No law, no law or curfew or anything is any good unless, it, unless it's followed through, period. Um, and so they, in Iceland, they're doing a really good job. And so the, the biggest thing that they saw in Iceland is parent engagement. Parent engagement, parent engagement, parent engagement, parent engagement. Right? And, and um, so when you have kids using this third space and they're doing different things, you, like, let's provide opportunities. Let's provide opportunities for kids. And the biggest thing is in terms of funding. The, 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 here's, the, here's the rub, you guys. So when individuals who are in the lower SES, socioeconomic status, they don't have the opportunities. They don't have the opportunities. In my school, we, are, like, we took away our late bus and our early bus. And that was a protective factor. We didn't realize it till afterwards. So we need to increase our protective factors for our kids. And we need to minimize our risk factors, period. So how we do that as a state and as communities, we gotta figure that out. Mike. Uh, thank you. Uh, this is a little bit of a left-hand turn. <clears throat> you probably one of the most articulate witnesses we've had here in a while, and I know that you're 16 years old. Thank you. There are some who would like to give the vote to 16 and 17 year olds. <laughs> what do you think, for local elections, what do you think about that? They want to say yes, but I'm so scared because they're like, <laughs> 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 because I think like, I just, I think of like, like for example, this matter, how many people like do drugs and um and so, cause, uh, so I have um one a close friend of mine has schizophrenia and I'm the way I, I'm so against marijuana like I feel like people think it's so shocking because like certain reasons but I'm I just I feel like why why so when I told him about like what I was doing he was like why because like we you know I want this so I could get it but 
I like the guy from Denver, I don't know his name, but TV. I believe it was maybe Corey, but he was talking about how like psychosis and how like this promotes that and that is this helps that. So I was doing this not only for him, and he doesn't know that, but like for many other people. So I don't know, I do want kids like us, I feel like kids like us just coming and speaking and influencing like your mind. But I don't know about like giving us a whole vote because we need like we well, you know, our prefrontal cortex isn't really developed yet. So we need that time. We need to that extra two years to like, you know, get right. So I don't know. <laughs> no, the way that like our sixth grade teacher used to say that like all the time. So I feel like that two years so it can like help just continue to develop. Like, I don't know. I feel like we're still really like immature. And I'm still speaking for myself, like immature and and young, so we need time to like just really think about <laughs> like, because every vote counts, like, the vote is our voice. So if we vote for something and we don't really know what we're voting for, some people would just vote for fun, you know? So if we're voting for something and we don't know, like, the result in that, we might just mess ourselves up. So, two years, let's wait to 18. Wait, yeah. Thank you. <laughs>